Um, so my name is Kenneth Morgan. I um, was actually born in Toronto, grew up in Mississauga, and after university, I moved to Guelph. Prior to all that, um, when I was young, in middle school, I met up with a Japanese, my Japanese art teacher, um, my art teacher in middle school, grade seven and eight, Mr. Mia, um, a Japanese gentleman of about five foot one, but he was the strongest person I ever met in my life. His shoulders would probably rip out of any shirt you bought. He and his brother owned a gym in downtown Toronto back in the 1950s. And after school, a couple of times a week, he would do, um, he would host weight training sessions. He would have, he had weights at school. And in a very short order, I became addicted to training with weights. So all through high school, uh, I think I started high school grade nine at about 115 pounds. By the time I graduated high school, I was up around 160. But I was also running probably five kilometers a day, eight kilometers a day for cross country running. So between cross country running and weight training, I, I mean, I just loved the physical fitness at the time. I went to York University where I had access to an even better gym with the uh, Toronto Track Center. Ben Johnson was there training at the time and a few other Canadian Olympians were there and you'd be working out with weights, doing squats and everything. And Ben Johnson would be right beside you working out. It was really, really oh, cool. Oh, wow. Um, when I graduated university, I moved to Guelph, um, got married, moved to Guelph, had a family, uh, still kept up with the, the weight training. And I um, became very, very serious into the weight training in fact, um, I started competing in bodybuilding and powerlifting. Uh, that, so that's that's my background, this, the bodybuilding and powerlifting aspect of it. While I was there, um, I was also interested. I've always been very artistic. I was actually accepted to art school years ago before I went to university, and I turned it down for some unknown reason. And so I was always creative. Like even now, I'm always have this creative outlet. And one of the things I enjoyed doing, I was a, a manager at a steel plant at the time. And on night shift, we would uh, take torches and the welding equipment and make sculpture. We would make um, cutting knives for, for the kitchen and things. And I noticed online there was a swordsmithing course in, offered in Guelph up in um, St. Jacobs. So I emailed the gentleman who happened to be Kim Taylor and he told me about this swordsmithing course and everything. And I was trying to get my work to pay for it, but it was about $2,500. And for some strange reason, they wouldn't let me go. But in talking with Kim, I realized that he was teaching um, the Ido in Guelph. So this would have been hmm, maybe February. No, not that early. Probably April of uh, 99. No, May of 99, because it was just after the May seminar. So about a week after the May seminar of 99, I showed up at uh, Kim's place in room 210 and at the U of G. I started training there for Eido and then Jodo and then Nitan. And of course, Kim, you know, he, he collects all the different schools and everything. So we basically trained in everything. So for about the first six years or so, I was incredibly dedicated probably going three times a week, spending countless hours doing that, and also still in the gym weight training. And very, very early on, um, from Kim and from the Japanese senseis, probably Omi sensei and Steven, I learned that all the weight training I had done was actually quite detrimental to my Iaido and my Jodo, because instead of using technique, I wanted to power through things. And that's been a challenge ever since. Um, like even now I, I still do weight training and even now I have to force myself to focus on the technique and let the sword do the work instead of powering through it. So it's, it's been over 20 years now and my body still wants to, you know, treat a sword like an ax, which as you know, is completely the wrong tech, the wrong thing to do. Um, after, so Things in life got a little busy. I had my own business for a while um, and I moved on with my life and I was probably down to once practicing once or twice a week with the I and Joe. Um, 
I went back to school, got my master's in education, and I moved overseas originally to Kuwait to teach. I was in Kuwait for three years. And my three years in Kuwait, I was teaching, I was doing weight training, and I was also teaching Iaido and Jodo twice a week. From there, I moved into, um, where was it? Changzhou in mainland China, about an hour by fast train west of Shanghai. I would go into Shanghai a couple of times a month and train Iaido and train Jodo with some people there. And oddly enough, one day I went to practice and there was nobody there. And I emailed them and I had no answer in anything. So I ended up mostly just training by myself. Um, from Changzhou, I went down to Shenzhen for a year. I was in Shenzhen training twice a week, teaching twice a week, Iaido and Jodo. And now here I am in Beijing and I train basically once a week here in Iaido. Um, but the class is only an hour and a half long. It's downtown. It takes me an hour and 40 minutes to get there, an hour and 40 minutes back. So in the last couple of weeks or so, I'm thinking of, of opening another, do opening my own dojo here. It would just be uh, much more convenient than having that type of travel time. Um, next weekend in Chengdu, I have to fly out to Chengdu. We're doing any idle grading here in China. So I will uh, be helping with the seminar on the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and I'll be one of the judges on the Sunday for grading. The setup here in China in the PRC is a little strange. Um, there's a lot of politics involved and money involved somehow. I'm, I'm not 100% certain how it works, but China seems to be, to be divided up into three distinct groups. I believe they each have their own Japanese senseis, um, they hold their own gradings, they hold their own seminars, and there's not a lot of interaction between them. I think this is true for Kendo, Iaido, and Jodo all, all together. Kendo, of course, is the dominant art. Um, China will be an incredible powerhouse in, in Kendo very, very soon if they're not already. The amount of people doing it is astronomical. Even when I go to Iaido practices, there's a great turnout and their skill level is wonderful, um, equal to or better than anything I've seen anywhere in the world. Next week will be interesting. Um, obviously, I'll be seeing some people I've never met before. Apparently, there's a sixth stand in Jodo out in Chengdu. So it'd be nice to actually train with uh, somebody at a nice level again in Jodo. Um, but like even here in downtown Beijing, there are some people who do absolutely fantastic Iaido. Beautiful cuts, beautiful technique, very, very professional, very, very strict, and they know their stuff inside and out. So, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for that um, overview of uh, the, the things, places you've been and your beginning. I was just wondering, taking it back to the early days when you said you, you had this Japanese teacher, art teacher, that helped you like discover the gym and weightlifting and all that. Were you exposed to any other parts of Japanese culture? Because earlier in Toronto, like these days, there's a lot of Japanese festivals and anime is all over, pop is all over. But mm -hmm. back in those days, they're probably, how were you exposed yeah. to Japanese culture in any way? Japanese culture, I mean, I mean it, it always fascinated me, especially back then with that, with that teacher. It really influenced me because of the Japanese art. Um, I mean, he was he was born here back in the 30s. He went through the um, internment camps back in the 40s. His family had all their property confiscated. Um, but he would also do Japanese art in the classroom. So it, it was a beautiful thing. Um, like I said, I was interested in art. He was interested in art. He got me into the weight training. So it was certainly a window into what Japan had to offer. Um, when I finished university, I wish I had known, but back then, without the internet, I really didn't know. I, I would have certainly gone to Japan to teach English like so many people did back then, but I didn't even know that was an opportunity. I mean, I've always loved traveling. I travel as much as possible, but back then I had no idea you could do that. Hmm. And when you learned about the, the smithing course, then that brought you into Iaido and all these other martial arts. Were you aware that they existed before? Did you look for anything no, like I that? Never, 
outside of Kendo, I had no idea that Iaido or Jono even existed. Mm. So, what was your initial impression when you when you started it, and how did you comp- how did you compare it to your already existing experience with weightlifting? Well, I mean, when I was when I started with Kim, who was there? Ed Chart was still training there. Jeff Broderick was still training there. Maury was there. Um, I'm not. I think Carol might have left by then. David had certainly left by then. But these are all, you know, the core sensei who are there now. And so I was training with most of these guys 20 years ago, and they're just a lot of it is the community. Like I'm sure you've seen it yourself. You know, after people have been involved in the Ido with the different dojos and that, after you know about a year after certain people fall off, everyone seems to have the same understanding of the world, the same appreciation for culture and the same intellect, you know, it it almost becomes like a family. And Kim was one of those guys, even now, um, he always encouraged us to go to other dojos, train with other people. So I would go down and train with Omi sensei. I would go down and train with uh, Steven, Bill mirrors. I would go down there a couple of times. So, I, I mean, it was wonderful. It was like a little family. So the result is when you go up and do a grading, you know, everybody, You've had beers with them. You've talked with them. So you shouldn't be nervous. You are, but you shouldn't be because you're actually very familiar with all these people and they're all very friendly, wonderful people. Mm -hmm. And then you, you did that for a while. And then when you decided to move to Kuwait, you had to either find something or create something again, like that. So how did you manage it? When I got, when I got to Kuwait, it's funny. I've traveled to about 40 different countries in the world. And I look for three things when I travel. I look for gyms so I can train. I look for scuba diving because I'm a, I've got my scuba diving dive master. And I look for Iido or Johto, especially if I'm going for anything more than a week. Um, I had been in Belgium for work for about six weeks just before I left for Kuwait. And I trained with some guys in Iido and Johto in, um, in Belgium, in Ghent. Yeah, I think it was only in Ghent I trained with them. I was shocked. These guys were the best I had ever seen in Iido and in Jodo. Their second dance in Joe, I think, would give the Japanese or the Japanese fourth and fifth dance a run for their money. They were just outstanding. Even their Iido, like the, the Iido and, and Jodo in Europe, from what I've seen, was just amazing. I, I was shocked at how good it was. When I moved to Kuwait, I had already looked it up, and there was a um, a Croatian guy teaching Iaido and Kendo down um, by the Arabian Gulf at one of the hotels. So I contacted him and I went down there and I started teaching Jodo there and training them with Iaido. He was, he was training them with Kendo and I was doing the Iaido and Jodo for the three years I was there. What, what is it like? Um, like I, I, that part of the world, I very have very little exposure or understanding of. It's, 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 it's odd. Like it's difficult, especially here in China and in the Middle East, swords are actually banned. So you have to be incredibly careful. Um, and ideally you want to have a police officer or a military officer or a politician in your dojo just to keep things nice and calm. Um, in Kuwait, one of the Kuwaiti generals actually trained in Kendo And as long as everything was kept at the international hotel we were training at, everyone was happy. But it was one of those, like even here, I don't take my sword home. My sword stays at the dojo. I can't bring it on the metro. I can't go anywhere with it. It's only in the Aito, but you have to be very, very careful um, so as not to get in trouble with the law in both countries. It's one of those things, don't ask, don't tell. I'm sure if you went out waving a sword around, you'd be arrested and kicked out of the country very quickly. But as long as you just have your own little thing going on, they seem to be okay with ignoring it. Mm-hmm. And and then the, the practitioners, the other people that you would train with, how do you, how would you kind of compare the different groups from the different countries you've had, had the well, opportunity? In Kuwait, when I trained with the guys in Kuwait, there was a Croatian guy, there was a Romanian guy, there were um, two Kuwaitis. Um, I think there was even an American guy and same thing. You know, there were uh, the, uh, the guy who was training when I got there was only a Nidan. 
But I mean, these guys are solid. They keep training hard. They work hard. They investigate. They go to seminars. They go to gradings. They're more than happy to help anyone out. It's it's like in Canada. Um, everyone's wonderful, and it's like a little community. Even here in Beijing, it's a little different. PRC tends to be um, kind of money oriented. Everything has a financial cost, which is very odd for a communist country, you would think. Down in Shenzhen, the people were um, a little bit less interested in the money aspect of it than they here are in Beijing. But I think that's just the way the country is divided up. The southern part of the country tends to be a little bit more liberal, and the northern part tends to be a little more conservative. Could you explain more? What, what do you mean by money oriented? Are they like just trying to promote things to to get as many people as possible, or are they selling um, items? Well, for example, I'm, I'm the principal of a high school in Beijing, a Canadian high school here, and I like getting in people to to speak to our students, obviously. And I've asked like business people, Olympians, Chinese business people, Chinese Olympians, restaurant owners, um, like judges and things like that. They all want to be paid to come in and talk to to our to our kids, which as Canadian completely baffles me because I can call up a bunch of people back home and they would come in of their own free will of their, on their own dime and have no issue with it. Uh, it, it's kind of the same here, you know, it's all, well, how much is this going to cost? Well, how much is this going to cost? You know, it, it, it's all about, they treat you well, please don't get me wrong. Like next weekend when I'm in Chengdu, my expenses are all paid. That's not a problem. You know, I, I'm going out there for them. I'm taking up three days, three, three, a three day weekend, basically from six in the morning on Friday till midnight on uh, Sunday night to work with them. But it um, like how the country is divided up into thirds, you know, like these people are not allowed to go to a seminar in this part of the country. These people are not allowed to go to the seminar in this part of the country. And I find it fascinating. Whereas, you know, if for the advancement of the art, I think you should train wherever you can go. Mm -hmm. um, I've been to Japan, I think about four or five times now. And through Jeff Broderick, uh, a few years ago, I contacted a bunch of people in Fukuoka and asked if I could show up one day and train. And they were all, no problem. And here's this foreigner showing up one Thursday afternoon at six o'clock to do Jodo. Um, and they're more than happy with it. And then they buy you a beer afterwards and see you to the train. I, I don't get the feeling that would happen here. Um, when I left Shenzhen, they were all very friendly. We all went out for dinner. But it's not the camaraderie that I would see back in Canada or in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you had mentioned you had stayed a little bit in Belgium. You had, we, then you lived in Kuwait and now in, in China. For the short stays, you, you kind of just go for practice, get to know the people. Um, but as you're getting more involved into a country that you've, you're living in, like you're, you're saying you're helping out with some of the major events, how, how have you kind of developed your understanding of the environment in that country? And how do, how do you start being involved more? Could you talk about like from, from just training and just maybe teaching in one dojo to doing more stuff? How do you start being part of the, uh, the organization more? See, in China, um, they don't have a lot of... Kendo is still the big thing here in, in the, uh, the four R's, right? Naganada, Jodo, Iaido, Kendo. Uh, Kendo is still by far the dominant, dominant martial art of the four. So in Iaido, there's really not a whole lot of people past fourth dan. Um, in Jodo, we have that one sixth dan out in Chengdu, but everyone else, you know, they're down uh, showdown or knee down. There's no one else higher rank. So when I walk in, you know, quite honestly, I would love to go into a Jodo with a couple of seventh dans and just practice. I, I would rather practice than teach. But of course, you know, it's, it's probably like if you're in rural Saskatchewan, you have a choice. You can practice on your own or you can open a dojo and help progress the sport. So I'm more than happy to go in and help progress the sport. And when you do that, um, you obviously meet people. The biggest problem here is the language skills. You know, most people have some rudimentary English, but then you have to get into detail when you're doing instruction. 
And so I, I've been forced to learn a little bit more Chinese than I anticipated just to get the proper concepts across. Um, but again, for the most part, the people I've met have been great. They're helpful. They're kind. I, you know, there's never been a problem. Everyone's been wonderful with the Ido and Jodo here in China. Mm. Where, where do you see it going in the next couple of years? How do you, how do you want to help it grow or develop? Like I said, I, I'm, when I'm in Chengdu, the president of the um, one of the federations is going to be there. And I'm going to talk to him about what I need to do about opening up a dojo in this part of Beijing, even if it's only once a week. Um, the gym that I go to, it has a, a wonderful dance studio. That may be the way to go. And that's only a five minute walk from here right now. And, you know, if I could do that, it would still be better to do three hours down there than do basically a five or six hour round trip to the place near downtown Beijing. Selfishly for myself, I would like to stay probably in Beijing for a few more years and then perhaps move to another country. Ideally, if I want to take the Ido and Jodo more seriously, um, I'd love to get to Japan for a couple of years and, and train. Um, you know, I'll go, I've, I tried um, my Jodo grading a couple of years ago. I met up with Jeff Broderick, trained with Fuakawa Sensei for a few days. But the problem is, you know, their, their gradings for Jodo and Iido, sorry, for Jodo, are the beginning of July and the beginning of January. And it's not prudent for me to get any time off and, and go to Japan for a month before so I could practice. So my biggest drawback for me is, you know, even if I practice, I'm practicing mostly by myself. So I've got to self-correct and self-correct go back to Canada once or twice a year. If I'm lucky, get a little bit of instruction, go to Japan, maybe once every 18 months, get a little bit of an instruction, but you need instruction on a constant basis and little corrections weekly, weekly, weekly in order to get better. Um, so it's a little bit detrimental for me, what I'm doing now in regards to Iido or Jodo. But on the other hand, if, you know, whatever I can do to help progress the art anywhere is to me a good thing. Mm -hmm. So when, when you move countries, are you, you're just sticking with uh, Canadian schools? Like you're, you're looking for jobs where you oh, no, can no. stay in education? How does that work? Yeah. Well, originally I started at a British school. Um, then I was at a British, sorry, a British school. Then I went to an American school and now to a Canadian. This is the first Canadian school I've been at, which is wonderful because I know the curriculum. Um, it really doesn't matter the curriculum. You know, if you're a reasonable teacher or a reasonable administrator, you'd be able to fit into whatever role you're put into. Um, the education system for the English speaking countries is essentially the same. You know, we might teach something in grade 11 where the Americans teach it in grade 12 or the Brits teach it in grade 10, grade 10. It, it's all really about the same. And once you you see what they're working on, it's very easy to fit in. And what attracts you to moving to different countries or different countries to be in these type of schools. I just love exploring, you know, like um, TripAdvisor and I are very good friends. Like I was in, I went scuba diving in Indonesia last year. And after I found the place I wanted to go to, the second thing I did was look up historical sites. It was a little tiny Island. So I knew there'd be no way I or Jodo though. I did look and so I looked it up and there were uh, Jack Japanese gun emplacements from the Second World War out in the woods if you wanted to trek through the forest. So, you know, after I finished my scuba diving, I went out one morning, grabbed some extra water and some food and just went for a hike and found the gun emplacements up on a hilltop covered by by weeds and thorn bushes and everything. It was wonderful. Just I just love ex doing the exploring. Mm. Okay. So going back to the three things that you, you say you always look for. You look for a gym so you can continue your weightlifting. You look for Yado Jodo um, place. And what was the third one? Just a- uh, um, Honestly, just- like oh, scuba diving, stuff. yeah. No, yeah. Scuba diving, history yeah. stuff, all of it. Yeah. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you see all three of those things fit into your life, into your growth as a person, into the interests that you have? How, how does 
all three of them mesh together for you? Yeah, you know, in Jodo is, is like I said, it, it, for me, it's always been a fight because I'm fighting the muscle mass, you know, like I, especially with the powerlifting, when you're doing the idle and you can bench press almost 400 pounds, it's so hard to hold back. You know, you want to, you want to bring the shoulders up and come down hard, but it looks terrible and it's, it's completely ineffective in the, in the, uh, in the art. So it, it forces you to look inward. It forces you to self-evaluate and to correct yourself. Always, always constantly correcting yourself mentally to be in that state of mind where you're not just powering through something you're using your skill versus the power. Um, when you're looking at the history and the scuba diving that I enjoy, it's also the same thing. It's, it's an exploration. So instead of exploring your own mind um, through Iaido and Jodo, you're exploring your character. You know, you're, you're seeing parts of the world. You're seeing how things were, um, how things are. Like when I was in Hong Kong for the first time, one of the first things I did was I went to the Commonwealth Cemetery from the Second World War, where the Canadians and Brits were buried. Um, I was in Rome. One of the things I did there was go to the Commonwealth Cemetery, you know, the military part of it all. I think it all relates back to the history and the sacrifice you have to make as an individual for growth. Unfortunately, these people paid a hell of a lot more price than you or I will ever pay. But I, I think it helps to appreciate what all these people have done before us. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that a lot of the, the people that stay in Yaido, um, not only are they like friendly, good people, but you said, you said they were all intellectual. Could you explain that a little bit? It's interesting, especially maybe because of the University of Guelph being a university, um, a university club. It, it was strange because everyone, you know, everyone was either working on a degree working on their master's degree or working on a doctorate. And I think now it's still that way. And when I've moved to other clubs, I always find that the people you talk to, I mean, education, what people's qualifications are never comes up, but you can always tell they're very intelligent people and they've analyzed things and they've thought about things. And when this is what, when you're in the, in the pub afterwards having beer and wings and you talk about other things, everyone's really well informed about the world. Everyone seems very educated. It's, it's just a wonderful thing um, to be with like-minded people. When I think about the people that surround us in the martial arts, I got this from like a, a business podcast where they say to improve, you need a plus minus or equal. You need a senior, someone that's uh, has more experience than you, more knowledge that can teach you, that can pull you up. You need a peer that you're always challenging each other, that helping to motivate you, helping to support you. And then you need a junior to put things into perspective, kind of look at what a beginner's mind is, or that someone you can teach. And through the teaching, you can understand concepts better. Who would your plus minus and equals be? It's interesting because as a principal at a high school, it's the same thing. You know, you have um, you, you have other principal role models you've been with that you want to emulate. Um, and you have a lot of certainly being older and with more experience. There's a lot of younger teachers who need guidance. You know, they they really want to try work hard. They really want to try. They really want to impress people. But you have to have them. OK, relax. You don't have to do everything right now. You have lots of time. We can work on this. So it, it, it's the exact same parallel from business, I guess, over to teaching. And in martial arts itself, um, here there, there's a lot of beginners. Everyone is certainly a much lower rank and less years in than me here. But it's also, I look to like people like Karuna Sensei and Furukawa Sensei and uh, Namatomi Sensei. You know, I, I still have many, many videos of theirs that I, that I look at um, once in a while, I'll be sitting here wondering about, you know, even, okay, in this particular, in, in Asian Rue, in this Kata, is it this or is it this? And you go and look 
And next thing you know, you're watching them for 25 minutes on completely unrelated matters. You know, it's, um, it's really interesting. It's Kim always said, watching the idols, like watching paint dry. And it really is. But then, but then sometimes you get just so engrossed by watching the paint dry. <laughs> you just get carried away with it. Um, the gentleman at the, the place I'm training with now sent me some videos the other day. And it was probably the first time in a long time I've looked at the videos and I could tell the sensei who was doing it was very, very skilled, knew exactly what he was doing, but I don't recognize the kata at all. And I'm actually very confused. I've been going through some videos trying to figure out what he's doing and I can't find it anywhere. Um, so I'm actually going to send it over to Kim later and, and ask him what the hell this guy's doing, because it's, um, you know, you've been around for a while. I've been around for a while. I'm sure we can look at something. Okay. Oh, that comes from here. Or he's taking that from there. This guy was doing something completely different. It was very good. And I could see the skill level, but I have no idea what he was doing. So it was really nice to, um, to get challenged like that and try to figure something out. It's almost like an investigation. Mm -hmm. What would you say in, in all these years, and could you describe one of your most uh, positive experiences in the martial arts, whether it's in Canada, in Europe, or in Asia? It would have been just after the May seminar in 99. I, um, I joined, I started up with Kim. You know, so there was the July, they used to have the July Sword School, Guelph Sword School, where they did the swordsmithing. So I was around for that. I think in, um, when was it? It would have been the following um, February. I'm sorry, the following May when I finally graded for the first time. And I failed my grading because I didn't have the, um, my etiquette was wrong. We had concentrated so much on the kata, working the kata, doing the kata correctly. We had neglected the etiquette. So I had to do a crash course with the etiquette. I think it was David, Carol, maybe even Sandra who helped me with the etiquette. And uh, Eric was there too. And I, I still made mistakes with it. So I failed my grading. But during that seminar, yeah, I'm not sure it was before or after I failed the grading, but Haruna Sensei was there. And I was out practicing. It was lunchtime or a break time. But I stayed on the floor practicing in the in the big gym in Guelph and I was practicing and practicing and then Haruna sensei just walked up to me and started giving me corrections you know for about 20 minutes straight he was out on the floor with me this absolute beginner and you know I've got this wonderful teacher and wonderful man giving me all sorts of one-on-one -on -one instructions and it was just it was really it was really wonderful that it meant that much that he he would help an absolute beginner somebody who's, you know, an eighth down Hachi done. So it, um, it had a really positive effect on me that he was that interested. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be one of your most difficult challenges now in terms of your Budo career? Just finding a, somebody, to, like you mentioned the plus, the minus and the negative and the, um, the peer it's, it's what it is here for me. Um, in order for me to get proper training, I need basically to go to Japan or back to Canada or to Europe or somewhere where the training is available. It's just that level of instruction isn't available here yet. Uh, they're still probably 10 years away from it. In 10 years, I plan on being well retired and back to Canada or somewhere else in the world. So for me, it's a challenge um, to find proper training. You know, I'll train on my own. I'll go down to the gym with my uh, Boken and my Joe and practice again, you know, it's um, a lot of times I practice the Boken because I don't want to bring a sword out in public. If I'm, if I'm training in a, a public gym in, in the dance studio, I don't want to have any Aito there. I don't want anyone to get into trouble. So I'm working with a Boken. So that creates a lot of challenges too. When I go to Chengdu next weekend, I can't bring my Aito with me. It's, it's just not allowed. They're illegal. So somebody out there will give me the Aito. Ideally, what I need is probably to stay here for another year or two and then try to get a job in Japan where I can train on a regular basis. Um, 
But as I said, you know, most, most of my training for the last nine, 10 years, I've been alone. So obviously my advancement level is, is limited because I don't have that person in the plus category, giving me the instructions I need. Mm -hmm. We don't know what we don't know. What, what would you be, what will you be most proud of in your Buddha journey of yourself? In my Buddha career? Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, like you can do a kata um, in practice or in a great area competition and be really proud of what you've done and thought, wow, that, you know, that was the best that kind of gosh I've ever done or that cut feels really good. But honestly, it's, um, it's, it's, it's being a teacher. Like even in the classroom when I'm teaching math or something and a kid has that epiphany and they get it. It's the same in the dojo. You know, you're, you're working with a newbie or somebody um, and they're trying to get something or they're trying to improve something. And then there it is and you see it and then they repeat it again and then they repeat it again and you know, they got it. You know, that's, that's the part where I think you have the most pride where you see somebody advancing through your instruction. It, it's not your own selfishness. It's like, good, he got it. And you're proud of his accomplishment or her accomplishment. You're not proud of your teaching, but you're proud of them. Yeah, and I can see it in, in the way that you're speaking about it. This is what makes it so that you would drive an hour and a half, 45 minutes to well, place and come back for, honestly, for them. Honestly, I could, just, I could just do my weight training, do some running. Um, I could do my the admin stuff at school, some teaching, go explore the country, go scuba diving and ignore martial arts because, oh, I don't have a teacher. But then what's the point? Why did I do all this for the, I, I'm not doing it so I can become this seventh Dan or an eighth Dan. It's never been my intention. You know, it's just, it's almost meditational when you do Iaido and Jodo. Um, it, it just, I don't know what it's like when you train, but sometimes I'll get out there with my sword not so much my Yaito, but when I have my Shinken in my hand, I'll be out there warming up and it's tight, it's tight. I'm telling myself to relax, relax, relax. And then after about a minute of sweet, just swinging the sword, you feel yourself relax. It's, it's almost like you were in a massage therapy and your body just goes, huh. it just calms right down. Your brain calms down and you can focus. You know, it's just, it's very therapeutic, therapeutic, yeah, therapeutic, you know? Yeah, it's interesting because there is this connection between your body and your brain and then vice versa. So yeah. one thing happens yeah. and then it reinforces the other one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do this for me. I don't do it for anyone else. I do it for me. At best with my age and with the level of instruction I've had for the last nine years, you know, if I hit six or seven in, in the I and Joe, I, I'll be happy. If I had continued my career and had never failed a grading and had all proper instruction, maybe I could hit seven or eight, but that's probably not possible, but it's not why I do it. So at this latter part of the interview, I just have some rapid fire questions. So questions that are relatively short, uh, you can answer, but you, but you can answer in a short way or a long way. Um, first one is, do you have a quote or a proverb or a motto that you live by or informs your practice or that you just like? It's always a self-analyzation. You know, you always, everything you do, you should do for a reason. You know, if, if you're going to go visit a cathedral, if you're going to go to martial arts practice, if you're going to go to the gym, if you're going to go for a walk, there needs to be a reason why you're doing it. That's all. It's, you know, otherwise you're just wasting your time. Hmm. What is your comfort food? <laughs> chocolate. Mm. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. chocolate. No chocolate, candy, chocolate, dark chocolate. Milk chocolate. Mm. Cadbury's Dairy Milk from the UK. <laughs> That's not the first time I've heard that. <laughs> uh, Have you had it before? Um, I think so, yeah. I had a, I had a coworker that they had asked like a friend to bring it back purposely when they went on a trip. So you just shared it with there's some there's some British stores in the Toronto area that you can get chocolate from the UK. 
you know, you would think dairy milk is the same everywhere, but the UK stuff, it's, it's completely different. Um, Walmart in Canada actually used to sell the British stuff. I don't know if they still do. No, actually, that is an interesting insight because when you travel to different places, dairy is probably the most obvious thing that seems to be different. Like it could say 2% here, 2% there, but the taste is yeah. different and just feeling is different. Well, exactly. Like here in China, most of the dairy we buy, um, the milk, not, not so much milk, but the butter and everything all comes from New Zealand. The, the packaged milk all comes from Germany. And then the fresh milk is all Chinese. And there's always, you know, it all tastes different from Canada. Every, every, every bit of it. Uh, if your sword or your Joe was a lightsaber, what color would it be and why? <laughs> If it was a color, orange, it would be orange. Um, it's just one of those colors that I, I think defines your personality. It's um, red is kind of aggressive. Green is very calm. Blue would be kind of cool, but an orange is kind of like embers. You know, it's just simmering a little bit. So I think I would go with orange. Nice. And, and last one before we wrap up, if someone were to log into your YouTube account and in the homepage, YouTube recommends you videos based on what you've watched in the past, what kind of videos would we see YouTube recommending to you? You would see three types of videos. First would be historical videos. Second would be art videos. And third would be martial arts videos. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Ken, for this interview. Like we've known each other for a long time, known of each other for a long time. Maybe had a few conversations, but never had a chance to do this. So I'm really glad we could. Um, you've definitely had a very rich life since departing from Canada and hope you bring back that experience when you come back. Thanks, Patrick. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Um, All right, man. Talk to you again soon. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.